All right. Hi, I'm Doug Lee. Um, this is a talk where um, if you do not pummel me with lots of questions, I'm going to be so disappointed, I'm just going to walk out. <laughs> so the question is, um, what's the difference between a concurrent algorithm and the stuff you see sitting in Java Util Concurrent that runs most of the concurrent parallel stuff on Java, Scala, Clojure, Habanero, lots of stuff. So um, this is a story about some of that. And like I said, I, 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 I actually demand questions. I have a, a little couple of vignettes on little bits of here's some problems you didn't expect. Thank God I like to deal with them. Um, because you probably wouldn't want to. Um, entirely audience driven, though. I have some vignettes sort of canned, and I'm happy to talk about others. Um, in fact, like I said, I, I, if you do not interrupt me a lot, I, I just will, will, will not know what to do. Um, OK, so some of you have been seeing these for a while. These are little tiny concurrent algorithm questions. They're not the kinds of things you think about when you're thinking about concurrent algorithms, usually. Spinning, blocking, waiting, field rewrites, CAS windows, thread local isolation, making sure that a leaky garbage collector doesn't um, cause your, the, the application to blow up. and. Um, you know, we write some code that really ought to be like C code. It's got to be heavily optimized. Um, and sometimes it's not. It's just interpreted. Wow. Um, so backing up, what do we do? Well, I think everybody sitting here knows what we do. <laughs> uh, we build the stuff, the lowest layer between interesting to you concurrency. Maybe you're doing ACA actors. Um, you're seeing things at a very high level of, of, of concurrency. We are providing the lowest layers, things like just raw atomic variables. And then from there up as far as we can go without, without biasing solutions towards particular niches and the like. Uh, we have a, a pretty, pretty high threshold of what belongs in Java Util Concurrent. Um, you know, I love the disruptor pattern. It's never going to be in Java Util Concurrent. It's a niche pattern. It's a big niche, but it's, it's a, if you're doing it, well, you know, the disruptor folks, they have an implementation. It runs on top of our stuff. Fine. Um, similarly, we, I talk a lot to the folks doing um, ACA actors in particular, or a whole bunch of other things. We provide what they need. Um, we don't go any higher. But if you're programming in Java and you're not using any layer component, many of you have used our stuff directly. We have thread pools, we have queues, we have a bunch of stuff that is sort of the middleware ground of the concurrency um, tier. So we sit right in the middle of all the action. <laughs> There's many, many layers between your application and some hardware. And there's many layers inside the hardware. So um, this is main, the main moral of this talk, is that things are never what they seem. And they're increasingly not even close to what they seem as we have more and more layers and systems. So there's you on top of core libraries who live on top of JVMs. And the reason I know all the JVM folks so much is because I yell at them pretty much all the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's my relationship historically with Cliff. Nice to see Cliff is above me for a change rather than below me. So much more fun for me. <laughs> um, but it goes further than that. I mean, the, we find that we see anomalies 
left and right because of hypervisors. I mean, hypervisors just, just, just make things unpredictable, weird. And we have to cope because, you know, we don't want you to care. Because if you cared, you'd have to be, as Rich was saying um, in this morning's talk, you'd have to be pulling out your soldering iron rather than making music. Um, really, you know, I love soldering irons. And I'm really not good at orchestration. <laughs> um, let me be. <laughs> um, all right. So the thing that's the, the main thing that challenges anybody building low-level concurrent parallel libraries is that there's a lot of layers, and each of them has its own things it's good at, things, policies that it, that it imposes without ever telling you, um, behind the scenes bookkeeping that can impact single instructions, as in JITs that will decide to change these single instructions, um, up through flow graphs and threads and um, object layouts and things like that. So increasingly, at the top level, you really have no clue what's going on. Um, and that that's not a terrible thing. Okay. On the bottom of this, um, part of the pressure is, well, what's the hardware trend? These days, it's putting a whole bunch of processors on a chip, each of which, in turn, has an internal structure that turns out to matter. How many caches do you have? How are they shared? How many sockets do you have? All, um, all really important in determining the performance of your application. And we want them not to be. We want to be able to give you good performance whether you have something that looks like this, something that is more Numa-ish, less Numa-ish than this, um, whether it has a lot of out-of-order instructions and asynchrony going on or not much of it. Um, that's, that's life with, with hardware, is that itself has a lot of parts. Um, you know, the, difference, the differences in memory models across processors is entirely these, um, these lime green and gray boxes. How do they do store buffering? And how do they do instruction scheduling? And that, that pretty much dictates the processor level memory model. More about that pretty soon. So the classic way to deal with this, also what something Rich also mentioned this morning, is uh, OK. We can't cope with everything. Let's start putting interfaces on our layers. Great idea, right? It's the only idea in town. How do you do it? Well, you do it badly almost every time in retrospect. <laughs> um, in retrospect, you say, oh my god, what did I do? And it's just an, it's an intrinsic tension. You can either over abstract, in which case you are making promises of things that maybe you really didn't want to promise, or under abstract and just have too many ver ver variations in your sub interfaces or sets of interfaces. So that's part of the, where we start. So what, where can we put interfaces that all of our users can cope with and don't impact our ability to deliver? And um, here's another case where, um, where you cannot get it exactly right. Um, there's a pretty famous one that I, I have here on the slide that um, says, um, you know, we, um, we want queues to be collections. Why? Well, because everybody knows how to use collections. And so now we add, add some, a lot of fancy concurrent ones. Well, they're just collections. You didn't really have to learn very much, and suddenly you can do a simple producer-consumer learning almost nothing new. Oops. That means that there's a whole class of algorithms that really are now unhappy to support that interface. Um, no concurrent queue likes to tell you its size, because it really doesn't know. How many things? Well, in a good concurrent queue implementation, you know, the number of elements sits in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> yeah. 
said, well, I mean it right now. How many? Well, no, there's no right now. <laughs> um, so size, you know, we, we cheat on a lot. We say in you know, disclaimers and a lot of key, key implementations, you know, when you ask for size, we're going to give you a number. <laughs> um, so that, that part's not so bad. The, the, the worst part is we do a little bit of over abstraction. I again on the slide and say, um, you know, collection has this method called remove of any other arbitrary object. That means we require that every queue, somehow or another, be able to delete an interior object, something neither at the head or the tail of the queue. Oh my God, we have put more lines of code into supporting a method that nobody in their right mind would call for a concurrent queue than almost everything else combined. Between iterators and interior removes, that's probably 80% of all of our concurrent queue code. The algorithms themselves, they're, you know, they're 20 lines. They're cool, but they're, they're not a lot of code. OK, so you get a feel for you can't get the interfaces right. And because you can't get the interfaces right at every level, no, everybody has the same issue, right? Nobody can get their interfaces right. So most common anomaly is fast path, slow path. Some things are fast because that API naturally supports something such that in the common case, everything happens in the blink of an eye. And then sometimes not. The, uh, the, the, the ancestor of all of these is the hash table, right? One of the earliest inventions of all of computing. Usually it's fast, sometimes not. Caches, usually they're fast, sometimes not. Caches with a MOESI protocol, often really fast, but their worst cases are, oh my god. <laughs> um, JITs, they decide they're going to compile the common code. How do they tell? Well, they do something really stupid in a parallel world. They put a bunch of counters there. Oh my god, counters, threads. Two threads update the same counter, what happens? Nothing good, right? <laughs> Even if you get the right result, you've just gotten a bunch of memory contention on a single location. Um, so um, you, get the, you get the pattern, right? Every layer has this tendency, increasing tendency over time, to encounter fast path, slow path anomalies. We exploit that a lot. Almost every line, almost every component I've written in the past five years itself includes randomness. Work stealing, our scalable adders, our completable futures. We put more randomness in it to smooth out these problems. How do you, how do you fight slow path, path, slow path? You, you average your way through it. Okay. Second part. You might be thinking about, I might be thinking about a concurrent queue algorithm in terms of this head and tail pointer and how there's memory loads and stores dependent on it and I compare and set an operation at the right time. You know, the stuff under me, it doesn't know any of that. It's looking at reads, writes, control paths, computations. None of the higher order invariants are kept at the lower layer. It just becomes dumber. It doesn't know something can't be null. Right? Logically, could never be null. It's a pointer. Null check it. Right? Um, these get worse and worse as you climb up the food chain. So in our fork join stuff, which is very well used and popular and works well, we have task dependencies. If the, uh, if the underlying compiler understood them, it could be a big help. It doesn't. And the last part is the secret weapon of every, every part of a layered system. Say, hey, 
we won't actually give you an API. We're just going to shove some code in between the lines for you. So there's you know, VMware. What does VMware mainly do all its life? Rewrites all your code, right? Takes all your binary, plugs in all the, all, all, all the, all the places where it needs to do a trap rather than an actual um, read or write. Um, so it's always just rewriting your code. Um, what does um, the JIT compiler do for garbage collection support? It inserts safe points in your code. It says, you know, every once in a while, even if you're not otherwise interested in garbage collection, I'll check to see whether you need to do some GC. So we can stop all the threads for GC. So systems decide that it's in uh, your best interest that they rewrite your code for you. And of course, while it's a great idea, code does amazing things. And not all of those things have been planned very carefully by the people who decide to rewrite your code. Okay. Last part, leaks. This is a very famous and now getting on very old issue. You would, life would be really good if you could cleanly decompose systems so that they were in completely distinct modules, components, and all of them completely didn't interact. All right? That's what you as an engineer should always be thinking, is we want to create these isolated, composable parts. But, you know, People have known ever since at least Herbert Simon's famous essay on it. 1962, anyone, the watchmaker? Anyone have a date? Well, if someone's going to Google it for me, thank you. <laughs> um, saying, well, you know, it's impossible in general. Okay. Nothing, no, no two subsystems are completely independent. That's true of physical systems. It's true of software systems. You have to pretend you don't believe that as long as you possibly can, because you, would, you need isolation as much as you can. But eventually, things cross layers. Eventually, things leak. Um, this was actually one of the initial observations that ultimately led Gregor Casales to create aspect-oriented aspect programming. But before that, I think he had a more insightful approach of saying, you know, for every API, there should be a meta API, <laughs> so-called open implementations, a good idea that was never, never widely adopted. Why? Nobody wants to reveal too much about their implementation. Nobody wants to give you tuning no knobs. I sure don't. I learned my lesson. How many people have ever used our thread pool executor? Doesn't it have like way too many tuning knobs? <laughs> so when we did fork join, said none, zero. You give us one number, the target parallelism level. We're not going to give you anything else ever. We promise. And the number of performance anomalies reported in fork join versus thread pool executor is. Orders of magnitude lower. Nobody comes to us and says, you know, I set my core thread threshold to this, and I, I didn't put a timeout, and, and, and suddenly things are slow. I said, yeah, you know, we shouldn't let you do that, should we? <laughs> <laughs> um, so this, this, this comes with the territory, is eventually every API designer makes their API less tunable because they all learn the same lessons in the same ways. <laughs> what that means is things become more opaque rather than less opaque over time. People have gotten good at lying. Ask your hypervisor how much memory you have or how many cores you have. It'll lie. Every time, it'll lie. It's designed to lie. You paid the money so it would lie. <laughs> OK. Um, 
I am going to delve into some mechanics details um, as we go on, but I want to, to give a, a theme of the, uh, some, that's sort of a common issue that all of these little tiny sub-algorithms hit is to remind you, um, a lot of you have been using data parallel uh, bulk operations um, for a while. It's uh, one of the, the few sort of uncontroversially you know, uncontroversial success stories about multi-core parallelism is um, parallel bulk operations. Every language that doesn't have them, it's going to have them. And they, it's, it's sort of nice. So they're, you know, filter, map, reduce, um, you know, just another dozen more and you're sort of done. Um, and, um, and it's sort of, you know, it's very, very seductive. You can do these things, and if you're dealing with a lot of data, you just get a lot of parallelism, and you didn't have to think too hard about it. Um, everybody who maps into that, whether it's Java coming up in JDK 8 mostly, or Scala, or Clojure, or all the others, um, they're usually, uh, they're almost always using one of the variants of our push join engine, um, which is uh, something that's now increasingly loosely based on, on Silk. Um, basic idea, though, is you would like to uh, do some bulk operation, like um, please compute the sum of squares. You express it as a reduction, saying um, map h a using a, a square function and accumulating them us using plus with zero as a basis. Um, some fun challenges about this. First is, you know, reductions in particular. They are such a common special case that even allegedly sequential hardware is highly parallel about this. It's doing all the prefetching, it's got, maybe it's got special multiply accumulate registers, it's pipelining stuff so that it can, it can run several of these at the same time. Um, so um, doing it explicitly parallel um, is a fun challenge because the, 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 this bar to success is you, you've got to actually be pretty good to be better than sequential because the sequential is already parallel. Say that a few times to yourself. <laughs> um, so that's what we do in Fork Join. We try to do this very low overhead um, um, and try to get speed ups um, in a way that everybody who loves this sort of fluent um, bulk parallel style can get a lot of performance with very little work and and um, and you know sometimes it even runs faster. What are the challenges? There's a bunch of challenges. One is if we're running on a multi-core as opposed to a GPU or simply a superscalar CPU, um, we got to split stuff up and get those guys running, doing stuff as soon as we possibly can. Because every nanosecond we lose in doing the initial split up is 32 nanoseconds of missed opportunity on your average 32-way server. So every bit of overhead up front is a killer, including the biggest killer of them all is just waking those guys up. It takes a long time. Yeah, could take, could take 100 nanoseconds just to wake up a thread, and then another million cycles for that woken up thread to actually do anything. Because maybe you were on some Sandy Bridge box that um, decides that, where the hardware decides it's gonna do all of your uh, clock throttling of your cores and core fusion, and it could be that that guy you woke up, he wasn't even a guy. He was a fused subcore of something that wasn't really even ready to do anything. So um, it can take a while. Ouch. Um, what, do you try to, what do you do here? You try to parallelize the parallelization. That's the big insight of, of Silk and everything that's gone by it. Um, so we uh, recursively fork. We say, oh, let's just split in two for now. Keep going. Um, and um, as of JDK 8, we have this scheme where um, 
where if it's, everyone is still sort of asleep by the time you've worked all the work, you just start doing it yourself. Just saying, well, you know, these guys are taking forever to wake up. At least it will get done somehow. <laughs> okay. um, all right, so that's a little bit of a view of, again, these, these things where you don't expect the hard parts of the algorithm to be where, th where they are. I, the work stealing, uh, fork join stuff, it's a beautiful algorithm. You, can, you know, I wrote it up in a paper. The silk folks before me wrote up another version in a paper. Um, you know, you can understand the idea behind it really in like 10 minutes. But you cannot understand my code in 10 minutes anymore. <laughs> or maybe 10 days, or maybe 10 years. <laughs> A um, little bit in more detail, so how, how do these things look? So you split them up, uh, so this is just doing like the sums of square task, and it says, oh, you know, just keep recursing down. Each time you recurse down, divide it in half. Uh, the way it actually does this is it, it creates this as a task object, a very low latency, shove it as fast as you can in a place where somebody can take it, and it just works feeling deck. Um, so when you say fork, it's just a few instructions. Put this somewhere where someone can take it. And if nobody's awake, wake them up. Um, so that's the fork part. The join part is, um, OK, I, the, the, the programmer told me I can't really do anything more until, until these complete. So I really, really need them to complete. Um, well, I really, really do not want to stop. Stopping a running train, aka thread, is not a pleasant thing. You got this thing going, you really want it to keep going. Blocking threads used to be, you know, you, if you ever took a currency course like 20 years ago, classic, you know, you did semaphores or monitors, make something go a little bit, block it. You know, it's just a context switch. <sighs> oh my God. <laughs> Just a context switch. Um, how many cycles to unblock a, block and unblock a thread? Well, you actually know the answer already. Could be practically nothing, but it could be one of those cases where this thing, when it blocked, when you unblock it, it's a million cycles to get back to its state. So you really do not want to stop it if you can help it. So the Almost all the engineering in fork join is not the fork, it's the join. <laughs> we do everything in our power to not make that guy block if we possibly can't. So we have these helping schemes where we say, let's look around for things to do. We have this great, um, in, for JDK 8, scheme called counting completers where you say, OK, um, completely relinquish the logical thread of control. Go back to doing, you know, helping people generically. The guy who finishes the subtask will do the, your completion for you. And that way, you're no longer stuck there. You can go off and do something else. It's a form of continuation, a very cheap form of continuation, one we can give you a little tiny API for that's basically controlled by casing an integer. All right, but at some point we got to block. How do you block a thread when it can't do what it wants to do? So we have the context here of a join. Say, I can't do anything until this joins. But it's a really common problem. Every lock, every blocking queue, every semaphore, every exchanger, every you name it, somewhere, there's this guy cannot continue until somebody else is ready. The problem is what motivates us to find all these things that do not block threads. That's why non-blocking algorithms are cool. Is they're not cool just because they're cool. They're cool because they don't block threats. Everybody makes progress. The biggest disappointment is that that idea of one-shot non-blocking algorithms, of which we have a large collection of them, 
do not nicely generalize. The whole dream, people who were at the panel session before, I said, you know, I, in my mind, generic STM is sort of dead. S generic STM is a dream that um, you can just arbitrarily extend this idea of non-blockingness to everything. And instead, you get live locks and all sorts of things. Um, so it's impossible in general, but you know, that doesn't mean we can't do it. <laughs> so what do you do when you, want to, when you can't get what you want? Well, there's really only two things you can do. We, 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 we mentioned all the helping strategies. If there's something other to do, please do it. You know? If you can find a way to help some other thread do this job done, do it. That's the whole join heuristics inside of fork join. It says, look around, try to be helpful. Well, all right, at some point, inevitably, you'll find you can't. There's just nothing you can do except wait. So two options, you spin or you block. Anyone have a, a third choice? <laughs> you spin or you block. <laughs> so you think, oh, how hard could that be? You spin and you block. So here's the spin part. What's wrong with that? And amazingly, a lot of things are wrong with that. <laughs> so here's the most fun one that's listed first. And this, is a, this actually happens all the time, every time on Sandy Bridges. Sandy Bridges, you know, I, the i7s were so great, and the Sandy Bridges are not. <laughs> um, anyone from Intel here? <laughs> um, contrarily, though, the, the, the recent AMDs are very much more well behaved. I'm not, I don't sell any of these. I just have them as test machines. Um, yeah, so one thing it'll do is it says, you know, if you're, just, you're, if you're just in a spin loop, we think you're in the OS idle loop, and we're going to power you down. It will. Or it may decide that it's going to um, elide some of the, the memory accesses, and it's going to either overwhelm the, the memory controller, and so you're just going to be clobbering your memory controller, or the opposite, in which nothing happens, and you're just not even paying attention to the memory controller. Okay. Little tiny things like this are because of this layering phenomenon. We have layers and layers. And the, the, at, at this layer, we are being deceived by the API. We sort of have this mental model of what's happening. It's not happening. So what do we do? Hold the thought. Or we can get to the other side, and then I can tell you what we do. Here's the other side of this. OK, the spinning part, impossible. The blocking part, well, also impossible. <laughs> um, how, do you, how, do you, how do you block a thread? Um, how many people have ever read any book I've ever written? Well, you know that if you ever do that, I'm going to come to your house and shoot you, right? <laughs> um, yeah, you can't do that because it's a race, right? <laughs> so you know, check it. If, it. if it's not true, go to sleep. The other guy says, oh, instead of true, resume. Well. Um, there's a race in there, so you can go to sleep and never be woken up. Not a nice thing. Um, so every layer of a system that blocks threads has to cope with this. Right? So if you're using Java monitors, the wait notify mechanism has to cope with this. If you're using, if you're us and you're implementing monitor-like things, there's, um, there's a VM intrinsic called park and unpark. It's got to cope with this. It's usually implemented, say, on Linux and few texts. Few texts have to deal with this. It's ultimately implemented by OS level shift or, or hardware level shifting. It's got to cope with this. Right? Every layer copes with this. And every layer decides, hey, I'm blocking a thread. It must not be doing anything important. Let's throw on a lot of bookkeeping right now. Um, 
The real sin is not that. The real sin is they're going to pile on bookkeeping on the way out. On the way out is the very worst time to, like, hit the OS rescheduler. But Linux, by default, will do that. Because when you're woken up, you're woken up for a reason. <laughs> you know? You're not woken up so that you can sort of contemplate the ideal universe and what, what memory affinity you ought to have. <laughs> um, so, hundreds of thousands of nanoseconds, millions of cycles, worst case blocking. Fall off cliff discontinuities. So, what do you do? You, have, you, you had two things that were impossible, let's just put them together. <laughs> so, this is uh, the basic idea. Everyone, I, anybody who's done this, you've, done, you've probably done this. It's like, hey, it's the obvious thing to do. It's like, spin a little bit, then block. How do you do it? Um, well, you want to do nothing for a while. How do you do nothing? Hey, we just saw we can't do nothing because, <laughs> because everything's working against us. <laughs> you say, oh, let's use a timer. No, don't do that. The timer is an OS facility. It's a finite resource. It, it has to be managed by the operating system. And in order to maintain tractability, timer granularities are vastly too coarse here. You know, maybe, maybe your timer wake-up queue is in 60th of a second. Not uncommon. Well, you don't want to block for a 60th of a second doing nothing. It's just like an eternity, right? How many, how many instructions can you run on a modern x86 in, in a 60th of a second? Any, any answers? 300 million, something like that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> A lot, of, a lot of instructions that you're not doing because you're waiting for the OS to wake you up. Um, so what do you do instead? Well, you find a magic number, which is what we do. Why? Because we're better able to do it than you are. We will test and test and test and test and find a good magic number. And then maybe five years from now, we'll change it. It's been done a few times in Java Util Concurrent. There are magic numbers that have changed. You know, the, the good thing is if you look at the curves, they're very flat. So you know, anything within an order of magnitude, it's going to be OK. Um, so if you actually look at some real code, um, Way, the way we do adaptive loops is uh, actually varies. Uh, we're not completely consistent because there are special cases and, um, and, and they, they sort of contaminate designs. And we don't like to like gratuitously update code. So unless something's hurting, we don't put the most recent version of our spin loop in it. Um, so how do you avoid spin loop? A great thing would be to Guarantee you're on some of the most recent Intel processors and use some of their weight intrinsics. Can't do that because not many of them have it. And even the ones that have it, they're a little bit weird. Um, so instead, what we do is generate random numbers. <laughs> Inside every spin loop, we ran generate a random number. And then we branch now unpredictably about how many times we're going to decrement that random number. Oh, we've just gotten rid of our spin loop problem in the most crazy way <laughs> by generating random numbers. And that's what we do. <laughs> so I first, I open up this talk saying, you know, a lot of the theme of this course is, here's things you don't want to know. <laughs> here's why you do not want to be writing this code. <laughs> I enjoy this. Yeah, you break branch prediction, to, and, and it, it's, it, works, it works amazingly well. <laughs> um, you know, I used to be too embarrassed to admit I did that, and just like, like well, you know, people just 
you know, my code's weird anyway. They won't notice that it's like <laughs> doing, <laughs> doing this XOR shift in the middle of a thin loop. They'll think, oh, it's just Doug doing weird stuff. <laughs> <laughs> then I decide I put it on the slide and come clean. <laughs> Um, how, do you find the, how do you find the thresholds? You stop spinning, you start blocking. Like I said, we, um, we've tried dynamic strategies. The dynamic strategies are really bad. Um, and the main reason is they're just, they're just, they're, they're two-sided optimizations. You cannot get at a good approximation without it saturating on one end of the continuum or another. It's a saddle point problem and you can't, you know, if you just think about it as an optimization problem. You need more data or more computation cycles to find the actual minimum. So most of these adaptive strategies, they, they will saturate out saying, always spin the least amount of time, because that hurts you least in the past. Well, that's not the right answer. If that were the right answer, I'd put in the number. Hey, I'm going to put in the number. Um, the other part, though, is we can take advantage of all sorts of situations specific things. So we can say, you know, in a queue, if the header queue is, is blocked, well, um, you should um, use a much lower threshold and block sooner because probably you're going to block two. Same thing on wake-ups. We, we are big believers in uh, one guy wakes up, helps wake up everybody else because waking up, it's a sequential bottleneck. Spread it out. Let all the guys help wake up all the other guys. Blah, blah, blah. OK, so <laughs> that was little vignette one of how do you implement fork join? Well, there's this elegant algorithm. And then at the very bottom is this crazy set of spins and weights. <laughs> Next part, same, same theme. We, um, we have a memory model in Java. It's, um, you know, it's actually a little broken. Um, we know that it's theoretically incorrect. It, um, it, has, it has some problems that need to be fixed. They're not too interesting in practice, but it does actually hurt in the short term because um, it's got to be updated, and no one actually has a great inspiration. We, many of us who were involved in the Java memory model we're involved in the C++ uh, memory model spec for C++11, Hans Thurm, me, Peter Sewell, and friends. And um, we actually learned a lot of lessons from doing the C++ one. And we also found out that doing, redoing the Java one correctly is much harder than the C++ one. Um, C++ gets away with saying, if your program has a data race, it has no semantics whatsoever. Right? It's allowed to blow up your machine. Right. No semantics whatsoever means anything can happen. If you make a single concurrency error in your C++ program, your program is allowed to crash. In Java, we don't like that. Saying exactly what happens, what weak guarantees you do get without data race freedom, turns out to be among the great unsolved problems academically in memory models. So we know that the current JMM is wrong about it, but it's not wrong in a way that matters to anybody. So we're letting it sit till somebody gets a big inspiration, hopefully someday. <laughs> um, the other part is that back when the Java memory model was being created, people said, you know, what we want is sequential consistency or die. We want something that says, your program acts, your multi-threaded program acts as if it were a single CPU time slicing all the threads. That, that's, that's, the, that's sequential consistency at an intuitive level. Um, some people think that that's the way human beings naturally think, so it's a good, uh, a good model. I happen to think that that's crazy, because I teach students, and they, they, they seem e equally lost talking about weak or strong memory models. Um, <laughs> so for Java, there's a strong memory model that is um, uh, approximately this table, saying you have plain loads and stores, volatile loads and stores. Of, uh, a lock is the same. A, a lock acquire is the same as volatile load, and a lock release is the same as volatile store. And it says, um, here's the things you just can't do. It doesn't matter. You don't look hard at this table. It doesn't. You know, it could be anything, and you wouldn't care really. The big problem is we have since found, or we have since regretted giving up 
arguing and losing back in, in 2001, um, you know, there are things that you cannot, can do that are completely reasonable, that are weaker than sequentially consistent, that give you the effect you want, and are cheaper, intrinsically cheaper. It's not they're cheaper on one machine or another. They're cheaper because they allow more internal hardware level asynchrony and parallelism. So they are not just cheaper on a x86, they're just cheaper. And so you say, why pay for sequential consistency when you don't really need it sometimes? This is a hard issue because um, people who were at the panel in the, the earlier session know, um, you know, there are people who say you have, most people should have no business thinking such thoughts because there are huge anomalies here. Um, there, there are, when you relax consistency models, things will happen that you never would have dreamed, and it's just because you didn't anticipate it. So usually these relaxed atomics occur in very well-defined <coughs> niche situations where you say, you know, in general, I'm not smart enough to think about the entire consistency of my program, but in this particular little bit of code, I don't need full consistency. I can do something faster and weaker. So that's what we do. Um, how do we do it? We can't use Java the language because it doesn't have these constructs, but JVMs have these constructs. And what I do, as I said before, I don't write Java code. I write JM, JVMEs code, right? I, and I write code that's used equally well in all the languages that run on JVMs. So the fact that there's no Java syntax over this, it bothers me not at all except the guilt thinking, well, maybe there's one or two of you that really ought to use it. <laughs> but if so, you know the secret in sauce, so I don't have to tell you. You can use Sun Misc Unsafe by some weird hacks, so long as you don't have a security manager running. So here's a classic case. In fact, it's, 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 it's a really classic case. It's the heart of the, remember I said, Fork and fork join, it's just, a, it's, just like, it's just like a stack push. Just, well, it's this. It says, I want to shove this thing in this some field, and now <sighs> write some other indicator saying that um, it's there. So I, I, I put a, assign some value to a field. So maybe it's a task header. I then update the field to that. I want to make sure that everybody who reads that task reads its contents correctly. Because if I put a task pointer in somewhere, you read the task pointer, but you had bad, bad reads of all the things that points to, well, that wouldn't work. So you can't prefetch ahead. You can't say, oh, I'm going to use the old version of C field, because why not? It's hardware. It doesn't know. So I need an ordering. But I don't need anything beyond a very simple ordering. I need these V's and P's to line up with an agreement with the, the, the secondary rule that will allow me a particular solution. So this is a common situation, and it's actually, if you do low-level low memory ordering, this and several permutations of it are like a little set of haikus you keep up, saying, um, here's the situation, here's the context, I'm going to null this, I'm going to produce it once. A lot of constraints, Each one, almost all of them have a good special solution. And if this is like you're trying to slice off cycle by cycle, remember every nanosecond you save is saving 32, um, you are motivated to find the weakest protocol that, that works. I am motivated to find the weakest protocol that works in Fortune, so I find it. It's that. It's pretty easy. As I, I have to guarantee that suppose, suppose this W is a task, and I need its state. It's, maybe its state is the lambda to run inside it, or you know, maybe its state is the number it's calculating the square of. I, um, I have to make sure that that. This write happens before this write, absolutely on the producer side. The, 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 the processor is not allowed to invert this order. If it does, I'm screwed. 
On the other side, I need to make sure that when I claim something, I claim it and I read it in the right order, period. So in the, in the case of uh, the work ceiling queues, I use the CASTA null trick because I need to do it anyway to keep things from my, to keep the garbage collector happy. As I got to, when I'm done with a task, grabbing a task, I got to null it out or else I just invite lots of garbage buildup. So I got to CASTA to null. It says, CAS to null says, um, I read it, it doesn't look null, I try to atomically update it to null. If success, I know only I had it and I cleared it. And now I can go on and read the task state and continue on. So this is a little weak memory pattern. And inside of uh, Fortran pool, there's a java dot, or sun dot miss dot unsafe dot put ordered int instruction sitting right there. <laughs> it's the only one I need there. I need it, but I needed it badly. I had no other way to get a good, clean solution to, to a problem that occurs you know, 500 million times a second. I, I, we, these, these function tests, they, they grow pretty fast. You're on a big machine, you're, you're, you're at like half a billion tasks per second. You know, if each and every one of them gets saved 20 nanoseconds, life is better. Sure. So, what's the performance differences between using the put order and using the volume right and the volume right? Um, so, the volatile right on every current. Oh, what's the difference? I'm supposed to repeat these questions. Um, how much do you save by using a put order versus volatile right here? Um, a bunch. On every, every machine known, um, in order to avoid um, something called the Decker's anomaly, you need a, f uh, a, um, a full M fence on every architecture. Um, the cheapest M fence um, these days is maybe 12 cycles, could be 30 cycles. Put ordered on an x86 costs you nothing except alerting the optimizer that it can't do that reordering itself. The compiler can't reorder it either. So it's, um, it's saving you like 20, 20 cycles on average. Um, on the other side, I should say an uncontended CAS on a modern machine is as cheap as, as a write, and it's not cheaper, an, a volatile write. So um, these days on recent um, x86s, uh, very best case atomic com um, conditional um, comparison set. I think, the, I think the best case reported is seven cycles. They're getting cheap. We love CASs because they're informative and they're, and, and, and they're getting cheap. Um, so you might say you do all this and you've loosened sequential consistency. And it's true. And, and what it means is every time you do this, we actually have somewhere at some level of some API Something that reflects that fact. Really? Yeah. Here's an actual Java doc for fork join task fork. And it says, has this disclaimer about, um, while it's not necessarily enforced, it is a usage error to fork a task more than once unless it has completed and been reinitialized. And the reason is that this handoff, because we have just done a put ordered, if somebody else does a write as well, we could never detect that conflict the way it's done here. We just can't do it. We've given up a little bit. But the great thing is, anybody who would fork a task twice is stupid anyway. <laughs> So no one even notices that we have weakened an API to give ourselves a more efficient implementation. And we had to add a disclaimer, but the disclaimer is like the most natural thing in the world. Who would have even thought you couldn't do that? Well, in our case, we not only had to remember that, we had to put it in writing. So not only is it stupid, but if you do it, we don't know. We don't tell you we don't know. We secretly do. We just don't know. We can't tell. 
am I doing for time? Oh, not much. A um, little bit on the limits of this. Um, you think you want consistency. You think you want strong consistency. You, um, you then start hitting example after example. And you say, um, well, what would any human being think about these cases? This is actually a very famous one. It's um, IRIW, Independent Reads of Independent Rights. And it says, um, if you have two independent observers of reading x and y, in a sequentially consistent world, they must agree on the order that they read x and y, even though there's no other constraint. No distributed system gives you this, even if it, quote, obeys the Java, Java memory model, um, because it's known to be theoretically impossible. It's a cap theorem. As systems grow out, things e the limits of sequential consistency as a model, the uh, cases for them grow thin. You probably had no thoughts about this at all. I, I, I invite you to find this sometime or jot it down and just stare at it a little bit and say, do I have any intuition whatsoever? Um, and if you don't, that's great, because that intuition will be guaranteed to be broken as systems continue into the future, even though this is a result that is absolutely positively not sequentially consistent. No distributed system guarantees this. Intel processors guarantee it, but they tried really hard two years ago to stop and unfairly got knocked down. The AMD people actually um, are, the, are, are the heroes here. They tried. They got knocked down, and Intel followed suit. Um, consistency will weaken. And the reason is that there's, there's guarantees that are crazy, um, and they don't match reality or intuition anyway. Um, a little bit what happens, the consequence of all this, is you try to do all this sort of weak ordering. Oh, no, the compiler doesn't understand what you're doing anymore. And you've got to sort of manually data flow optimize your source code. Because, um, because it'll think that it can't like reorder instructions because you're using volatile variables, but you're using them in a not volatile way. Um, so I actually have to do a lot of, pull a whole bunch of things into locals, do a lot of stuff that looks like low-level C code, but it's still Java code, it compiles. <laughs> Weird things, how do, you, how do you get a good CAS loop, I mean, CAS until success? Don't do while, do do while. Why? Safe points. Remember safe points I mentioned long ago? Yeah, they're not your friend. Um, you know, just more the sort of idiot savant compilers. You know, the great thing about JITs is that they work so well, and the really bad thing about JITs is that, you know, sometimes they're idiots. <laughs> Little things. Um, you know, I, I really, really hate to put the, the first bit in slides. Is, uh, you know, why should you not use assert statements? Oh, it's so sad. Because they add to the method um, in bytecode count. And that means that the inliner is going to say, oh, this thing's too big to inline, even though it's a big, long assert statement followed by return zero. Um, so we don't use asserts inside Java Util Concurrent. And it makes me, makes me cry almost. <laughs> Um, <laughs> relying on invisible code, if you know that null checks are going to be inserted anyway, rely on null checks. Every special check should be a null check, because a null check's there anyway. Anytime you want a special condition, it better be a null check, because it's the only good one that doesn't hurt performance. <laughs> um, boxing, oh my god, I hate boxing. Um, <laughs> class loading appearing at mysterious times. Wow, stories I could tell. <laughs> compilation plans. Compilation plan is the order that your code is compiled can matter. It does. Um, all right, I'm going to stop there because I have to. <laughs> um, yeah, big moral is that you know it's a fun world. It's a world that's increasingly stratified. Is the people working in these layers are, are armed with really heavy-duty soldering irons. 
it becomes harder and harder to roll your own as time goes on. Um, it means that m more breakthroughs and getting better APIs, I'm, the, the, the whole, you know, promises with actors style is one pretty popular that gets you away from a lot of this. The whole bulk parallelism using a fluent API, another that gets you way past most of this. And um, most of the time, that's where you want to be living. When you don't, OK, it's really fun. I, I have the greatest life in the world. But it's, I don't try to build applications while I'm at it. <laughs> I just try to get this part right and hope that you guys will blow me away with what you do with it. All right, that's past the end of my talk. Sorry to um, talk so much. <laughs>